Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have the truth panel with thinking DOM types. So we have extroverted thinking DOMs, which are the ENTJ and the ESTJ, and we have introverted thinking DOMs, TI DOMs, the INTP and the ISTP, and we're all gonna discuss truth. And so Kat, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Sure, hi, I'm Kat, ENTJ. I live in Philadelphia where I am a property investor, manager, and landlord. And I do some profiling on the side and I've been studying typology for a number of years and I'm pretty excited to be here. So thanks, Joyce. Yay, I'm excited to have you. Yeah, and Amy? Hi, my name is Amy. I live in the Phoenix area. I've been into type for a couple of years and I have four small children and a husband and and just enjoy doing these things. <laughs> They're great fun for me. Yay, I'm glad they could be fun. <laughs> and James? So my name is James, and I'm an INTP, and I'm from Ireland. And James is a doctor. Dion? Hi, Dion here from New Zealand. Um, I work as a software tester. My hobby, model building. Um, and my Enneagram 5, the inspector, and I feel like one. Excellent. And hi, my name's Joyce, and I'm a certified MBTI practitioner, and I facilitate the instrument and organizations. And so truth, when I say the word truth, how do you interpret it? How do you see truth? Having studied computer science and being extremely logical, I have a great tendency to evaluate truth according to logic statements. So uh, I'm not sure if you'd call that absolute truth. So, so when, when statements are presented in a fashion that works very well for this um, easy to tell true or false, that's great. Life doesn't work like that. Um, we have a lot of gray areas and the ISTP certainly, I don't know about the other types, um, you learn to deal with the gray area um there may be a tendency to be pedantic about uh the letter of the word stated and correct people but um you, you'd be spending all your time doing that if you were gonna want want people to speak absolute truth all the time so yeah i like the absolute truth but you learn to deal with the the fuzzy logic i think there's a couple different kinds there is like a subjective truth, which is like your opinion and somebody can't change that for you. Like what your favorite color is, what your favorite movie is, who you fell in love with. That's your opinion. And other people really can't tell you that you're wrong to have that opinion. I think there's an objective truth like, um, you know, stop signs are red, you know, um, uh, that's a dog, you know, uh, it, this is the color even though you're colorblind, that still makes you wrong. This is the general agreed upon color of, you know, that's out there. Um, and then I think there, uh, uh, absolute truth is, or relative truth is usually more of a difference of uh, religious philosophy, in my opinion, you know, usually people who believe in absolute truths have a religious background, people that uh, believe in Sometimes the other word for it is moral relativism, um, but I'm not sure that's the greatest word choice for that. Is uh, I tend to know people who are more of an absolute truth variety than other philosophers. So, um, and an absolute philosopher, absolute values philosopher would say that uh, their religious system dictates what is actually truth. And I don't really think that's the question you're asking today, <laughs> but, um, because uh, we're not here to have a religious debate per se. <laughs> um, we're here to learn how to communicate better with people. And so that's uh, a totally different issue because I've had a number of times where I have thought I was talking on the same wavelength, saying something was true and other people are like, oh, that's not true. And, I'm, and it, 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 I think that's where probably our conversation today is gonna go is, well, if I make this statement and I say it's true and you look at me and go, oh, that's false. Why do you say it's false versus why I think it's true? And usually that sticks more in the realm of um, uh, objective truth. You know, I might make a statement that's too much of a generalization, which would be very easy for a TE Dom to say, <laughs> generally speaking. And But I don't forget to put generally speaking in front of that. <laughs> and I say something's true and somebody looks at me and goes, but there are exceptions. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 
there are exceptions. Okay, so <laughs> back up, rewind. So, in terms of what Dion said about identifying uh, things that he considers to be true, or he uses some kind of a, a logical framework or an analysis, um, I probably would utilize a similar uh, method, but it's it's subconscious. I wouldn't say I'm consciously doing it. And um, so, if someone were to make uh, a statement about um, what they were to consider a fact or something like that, I would I would typically focus on. Uh, whether the statement itself was contradictory um, or whether it uh, had some sort of a problematic component to it. So in terms of whether something is true or false, if the statement itself is directly self-refuting or contradictory, then it, it, it uh, as a matter of pure logic, it can't be true. So if somebody was to say something like, um, this, this particular object in my hand is uh, both red and green all over, that's clearly false. It, it can't be both of those things all over at the same time. And um, so statements like that, we can certainly say are false. In terms of what we can say is actually, you know, what, what things can we say are actually true? Uh, I think that's a, potentially that's a, a more difficult, that's to me anyway, that's that's a more difficult matter to try and get to the bottom of. And um, in, in terms of categorizing truth the way Amy did. And mm -hmm. um, so I don't tend to categorize um, things that I consider true or false. So to me, if something is true, then it's true in virtue of the fact that it has particular properties um, and it has the property of being true. So it, what I mean by that is there is some sort of a proposition that reflects the way reality actually is. So if somebody makes a claim or a statement and it can be verified as true, then it simply has the property of being true. So whether that particular statement refers to what happens to be my favorite color, which was one of the examples that Amy used. So let's say my favorite color is blue. So that has the property of being true, but it has no no more of a property of being true than a statement like the stop sign outside is is red. So they're both they're both true. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I wouldn't I wouldn't distinguish them in terms of uh, in terms of the, the truth claim or the properties of it. Now, in terms of uh, absolute truth, so I think that's something that's that's something that's a little bit more difficult to for me to define because when I think in uh, potentially what if Amy, if I'm if I'm correct in interpreting what I think you meant, you're, are you talking about things like scientific theories or religious perspectives or? Yes, you, usually okay. people who believe in absolute truth are usually coming from a religious back background where like uh, a god or philosophy is dictating something as being true as opposed to a religious prop uh, as opposed to a scientific proposition where uh scientific principles we've proven a lot of them and they are true but there are still some that are, we generally accept as true but we just haven't truly proven them and so therefore we tend to argue about them <laughs> still so i so in, in terms of absolute truth then i kind of uh, i would this is kind of a superficial way to divide this up, but it's just, I'm just, I'm just going to try and make it as tangible as possible. So I think of truth in an absolute sense in on one hand, in a kind of a metaphysical way. So if you're positing God or you're positing uh, some underlying scientific laws, laws of nature uh, or quantum particles or something like that. When I use the word metaphysical, what I mean is that there either is or there isn't entities that those names refer to. So there, there is a, either there is a God that, you know, that our beliefs can correspond with, um, you know, or, or, or there is or there isn't subatomic particles that our theories actually explain or not. Um, and so, so that's the metaphysical sense. So that's the sense of in principle, those things could exist. And then on the other hand, there's, there's the, what I consider a more, more of an epistemological way to consider it. And that would be, uh, how can we learn about those truths? Like, how, how can we actually say we can verify them? What methods can we use to say that actually we can say that God exists or we can say that there are subatomic particles? And that's actually the more difficult part. Because if- I would agree with you. What, what I think about is if, if what we think we know about the universe and the laws of nature is really true, we have no one but ourselves, or, or at least we can't get outside of ourselves to verify the truth of those claims, if that makes sense. 
So whether or not they're actually true, it isn't clear to me that we can actually verify their truth. So we don't have some kind of all-knowing spectator who can say um, Schrodinger's wave equation to describe, you know, the wave function of interacting electrons. You know, you've hit the nail on the head. You're on the right track, guys. Keep going. I'm not sure that we're ever going to find that out or there, there isn't somebody going to just pop up one day and say, yeah, you know, you're, you've hit the nail on the head there. I don't, I don't see how we're going to verify any of the things objectively that we posit is true. So that, that they would be some loose ways that I would think about it. That's fantastic, James. When you talk about medicine and you being a doctor, you, you mentioned how you like medicine, not for like the actual medicine, but you like the abstract theory behind the medicine or something like that? Yeah, so I, I kind of, the way I view my job, I suppose, is the most interesting part of it for me are the questions I can ask about the job rather than the practice of medicine. And um, so in medicine, we assume that there's there's tons of objectivity. So we have, you know, a catalog of diseases. We have tests that we use to diagnose them. And we have drugs that we prescribe every day. Um, to try and help people with their illnesses. And it's generally assumed among doctors and scientists and the people who take these medications or who attend their doctors uh, that all of this is objective. And that if you have um, this particular disease state that um, this represents some, some sort of objective entity that we've now coined as, um, trying to think of a name, depression or anxiety um, and we, we put all of these things into catalogues and um, you know, we have criteria in, in the way in which we describe them. Uh, so it's generally assumed that what, whatever, whatever um, science has to say about medicine or physics or chemistry or biology uh, is, is just objectively true. Uh, and we're describing real entities in the world, we're describing real facts in the world. And uh, there's nothing more to say about it other than that. Uh, but it, so in terms of medicine, I mean, what I find interesting is that if you just look historically um, in terms of the developments in medicine, the names of diagnoses have completely changed. Some, some have been thrown out. Uh, some have been uh, conjured up on the basis of brand new evidence. And it's hard to say that a particular, a particular illness or a particular category of diseases is objective or binding if they're constantly changing uh, and we're finding new ones and we're finding that old ones didn't exist. And the same doesn't just apply to medicine, the same actually applies across the board in terms of scientific discoveries and things like that. So it's, it's, in terms of truth, it's kind of hard to know exactly what truth means when uh, whatever is the considered true seems to change and take on a new form. Um, it's kind of hard to know exactly what it is, I suppose. It is true. Yeah. The things that some people sometimes accept as objective truth is actually changing too, like what you were mentioning, definitions over time change. And yeah, really great points. And so Kat. I've been thinking a lot this week about um, a lot of truths are really, and I, Amy, I think you kind of touched on this, is like a lot of things that we accept as true are just I mean, this is the sociologist in me too. I studied sociology for a long time, but the, the things that we take as true are just things that we've collectively agreed to be true, um, whether they're they're actually quantifiable or measurable or uh, or whatever else. Um, and I think that's actually true of so many things that we take as truths in life. It's just like, well, we all just agreed. Um, there's so many social constructs. I mean, even money, like. There, money actually has no value. It's just we all decided it's got value, so so that's so it does. Um, and I think about that in terms of language. Um, Amy, you were mentioning colors or something earlier, and I was thinking about how, like, you know, green is green to us, but in another culture, it it may be another color. Um, I think like the the Inuits have like different a different color, a different word for like white or something like they've got a different got way a of bunch of different words for like ice and snow and versions of white yeah. yeah they've got like 40 or something like that yeah so i think about language a lot too and and what meaning that gives to uh the things that we apply them to and the way we just sort of take those things for granted 
Um, and then I was thinking also about kind of just while everyone was talking about TE and um, I think a lot of times I have an interest in just like the utility of the truth. So it, you know, what what is the, uh, I think there are often cases where that's, that's maybe my prime consideration when I'm evaluating a thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes complete and total sense. Yeah, what, what Kat was saying there, I think, I think there are probably a lot of people out there that view truth as some kind of obscure platonic uh, thing that just, you know, we don't really know what's going on, but what matters is, you know, what we can do with the information we have. And I think what Kat said is probably correct in that we basically what's what's termed as true or what's considered true is is what people agree on in terms of consensus. Um, and, you know, one, one way to approach the question, I suppose, is, you know, does it really matter whether or not something is true or, or does it does it really just matter that, it you know, we can make use of it? Um, and there's there's actually an entire uh, school of philosophical thought called, you know, pragmatism uh, in epistemology, where basically they, they've decided that, you know, truth is whatever works. Um, so, you know, if, if, if E equals MC squared can be applied and applied in a very useful way, then, you know, we just we just say that it's that it's true. Um, and I think I could be wrong here, but I think for a lot of TE users, that is the main consideration. Um, I think, whereas. I think one way to describe that is the fact that I prefer so much to think in black and white about everything. And I prefer to feel like I am standing on an actual basis for my actions that I want to, I want there to be a truth. So I will cre create one and talk like I have one because that's where I feel comfortable. Like I'm like, I've got an assurance of where, I, of reason, you know, and sometimes the reasons aren't always the best or the most delineated. And sometimes there are exceptions to the reason, but i I want to gloss over those as a TE user because I want to feel comfortable being in the truth or like I'm saying something that I feel like I've got a basis on. I, I don't tend to go around looking for the exceptions as much as I'm looking for the, the generality and the utility of it. I don't want to be looking for the exceptions. The, the exceptions are something that um, are usually something I acknowledge after the fact, usually after I've tried something and failed is when I acknowledge an exception exists. But until that's happened, I'm gonna act like there isn't an exception to things. Where I I almost wonder if for TI DOMs, it, it's the, you come to truth the other way around, you know, where you're looking for the exceptions first. And once you've kind of weeded out more of the exceptions, then it's like, okay, this is this is this is more actionable where I would think that I think for a TE DOM, it's more like, okay, action first. Oh, trip fall. Never mind. Here's the exception. <laughs> TE is really good at sort of, it wants to, to have a view of the dashboard, you know, and get kind of the, the general framework rather than be distracted by the exceptions and um, those little bits and pieces, because we, we can make things happen more easily when we're looking at, the generalities and kind of the the overarching themes and in some ways maybe the stereotypes and things like that we will look at the we'll look at the other data but um we can move a little faster and we can we can uh just generally i think be a little more effective when we're when we're able to look at kind of what the the so i'm just agreeing with you amy i thought that was a really cool point yeah extroverted functions they try to look for the gist so it's trying to get the gist of it yeah Whereas TI is more intricate with trying to pick it apart before doing anything with it. Yeah. And it can it can make TI DOMs see a, seem a bit tentative or open-ended. So, you know, when James was talking, it's kind of like he's leaving it open. Like you don't know, you don't have like a firm black or white answer to it. It's kind of like a, you're leaving it open-ended. I, I noticed a lot of TI DOMs, they include a lot of qualifiers in their speech. Because then they're like, well, there's a qualifier here and a qualifier here. Uh, yeah, whereas TE DOMs don't normally. 
we should, <laughs> we should, we should be the ones using qualifiers for what we say, and we don't. And TIs usually shouldn't be using qualifiers because they mean they mean exactly what they're saying even more than we do, and but they are using them all the time. <laughs> I think I think the qualifiers often come in in clarifying what another person has asked or stated to 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 truly get to what what do they really intend to ask. <laughs> And, and what do they understand by the meaning of the words that they've just stated before we go into a true or false situation there. I found that definitely to be true with talking with, uh, I've got two brothers who are most likely uh, TI doms or one's a TI dom, one's a TI ox. And uh, they tend to caveat things a lot more, but I think it's, yeah, it usually does come from the place of they're trying to make sure they understand what you're saying or they've already ran into problems with this, so they already have learned to caveat their statement before they say it. Amy, I thought you said something interesting earlier. You said um, you you kind of wish or want some element of truth, or you, you you is it something you kind of feel that you need in order to in order to feel like you are on firm ground and that you mm -hmm. you have some kind of direction? Is that kind of what you meant you have you have somewhere to, you have some yeah. starting points on, on which to to base yourself and your surroundings yeah i don't like uh i need a a firm foundation for my actions like i need a reason for my actions i need a, a either a background or a leg to stand on whatever metaphor you want to use there um for my actions so i prefer to find either um, a, a truth to use for that or something that or maybe uh, a truth that's an explanation for why I'm not doing something. You know, this, this is a, this is a not truth. This is why I'm not doing that. Cause this is, you know, <laughs> this is the not truth that causes me to not do that. Um, because like with my kids, I've learned to, when we're talking about like, say lying, there's a difference between when I'm asking them a subjective truth question versus objective truth question. I, you know, if I'm asking them like, what's their favorite color? I tried very, very carefully not to accuse them of lying for whatever, even if the answer is different when it was 20 seconds ago, you know, like I try not to argue with them about those things where uh, my four-year-old is in a habit of, he wants to argue with everything. <laughs> so like, you'll even be saying like, you know, that like looking at you know picture book and he you know you, you could be saying like that's a cow and he'll look at you and go that's a dog and it's like no 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 <laughs> really that's a cow stop calling it a dog <laughs> you don't get like you will drive people insane if you do this so this i will argue with him back and forth and say no 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 you really you have to you may be as we like to say, standing up on the inside, but you have to be sitting down and listening to mommy when and calling it a cow. And mommy said it was a cow because you could drive everybody crazy if you don't. You know, he's allowed, you know, his own uh, per subjective opinions on things. But you know, there there does come a point where it's like, okay, I, <laughs> we need to be able to agree that this is a a thing because otherwise it gets confusing too. You know, which is something that. I don't like confusion, you know, that drives me crazy because it's a uh, loss uh, of, you know, time, capability, any number of quantities that I don't like. So I always want to be able to uh, have a place where I'm going, you know, have a reason for what I'm doing. I, and, and sometimes it's, and usually it's at least some sort of an answer it may not be the most well thought out answer at the time, you know, because I'm TE, which means I am out here doing it first. So I'm going to be out here doing it first. I'm going to have a knee jerk reaction, give you a truth at the moment. When you shove something in my face, you're going to get a truth back from me. And then afterwards I will go inside and post process and go, okay, was that the best answer I could have given at the moment or the best action I could have taken at the moment. But that's going to happen after the front back because I'm an automatic responder to all events around me. You know, all questions, all events, I'm an automatic responder. So I'm going to have to, uh, there is always a sense of a knee jerk reaction going on to everything around me. It's hard for me to take the time to say, okay, they asked me a question. Let me really sit here and think through my answer. That's very hard for me to do. 
it's something that's definitely a learned trait for a TE Dom. And Amy, would you say, um, would you say that you find it very, like, do, you, do you hold your beliefs very close to your heart? It depends on how much I've thought through them. You know, um, I do say there are some irrational FI things I do hold, but usually, especially at this point in my life and with the knowledge I have, I know th those are irrational opinions I'm holding and I'm okay with that. But um, I do like to have a reason for that. But yeah, I do freely admit a lot of times my reason isn't always well thought out at first. But the problem is I usually sound like I really thought out my answer because I'm forcefully shoving back an answer in your face <laughs> or an action towards you, which gets really confusing when people are like, oh, what about this exception? And I look at them and go, oh yeah, that's a valid exception. And they're like, I didn't expect you to have that answer. You know, <laughs> I didn't expect you to think that this this was a valid exception going on here. Yeah, no, the, the reason I ask is that I'm often, I, I don't have any firm sort of attachments to, you know, any beliefs that I may have or any views that I may have. And they're, they're always subject to change. If something more logical comes along or somebody can give me a better reason for, for seeing it a certain way. And um, so I would say I'm, it's truth isn't necessarily something I go out seeking, but it's something that's definitely malleable in my mind, depending on the new kinds of information that I'm taking in. So no, nothing is really fixed in terms of black and white, true or false concepts. It's kind of like a framework that's constantly being updated. Uh, the more I, the more I read or the more I learn. Um, and I, I kind of, it, it, it sort of, it sort of adjusts itself in terms of the information that's coming in. It's funny you say that because I would say my my sense of truth is the same, but I would say that currently I possess truth at the moment, even though I'm constantly updating it and refining it with new information. I would say I currently possess truth at the moment, and I'm very I feel f most of the time pretty stable on the truth I have. You know, if there is an area where I've ran into realizing I have not thought this through enough, then. That area made me shaky, but I'm probably also going to leave that area alone and not utilize it for a little while until I can come come back and firm it up. You know, I'm not comfortable using that area then until I've come to a better conclusion because I have to be sit, feel like I'm sitting on truth at the moment, even mm -hmm. if I know that I'm going to be learning and adjusting certain parts of it. Yeah, it's like TE wants truth sometimes for it to be like, it wants to have something there so it can be actionable, yeah. TE is logic with an end goal and TI is logic that doesn't always have an end goal. <laughs> I, I don't know, so judges in general tend to have an end goal orientation, but like with extroverted thinking, it tends to have, you know, Amy was talking about that sense of rushing to 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 get things done i don't know how to explain it <laughs> respond i have to there i love feedback because i'm always responding currently to whatever's going around around going on around me mm -hmm. i'm mm -hmm. always in a current auto response as much as those like uh, you know you send out email and all of a sudden you get bounced back from it i'm always bouncing back emails it's just depends on whatever my programming is at the moment what email i'm bouncing back to you automatically and, but if I'm going to change that bounce back, that takes time on my part, which I don't like to do at first. Mm -hmm. So. It's listening to James uh, and, and Amy, and I don't know if I'm, obviously there is this framework, as James said, TI DOM has a framework and everything gets pasted onto it. Whether it has reference now, reason now, rationale now, or for later, it's it's available to slot in and adjust. Um, so it certainly doesn't need to prove anything in the immediate. Um, relating to what Amy says, I certainly don't need to action things immediately. In fact, I'd almost prefer not to. However, what what I would say is that uh, when when observing people and hearing statements there is a tendency to immediately categorize them subconsciously um because as you've heard in um speaking to other ti doms uh, ti is like just an os that's constantly going so it just 
with without trying it just applies values to everything that is heard in in stark difference to what amy said i would never hold an fi irrational value on something when when logic has identified that that's irrational i would immediately override that and if i just get stumped right to the bottom um, and and it, and especially um irrational ones um I mean, something close to that might be that you might like a particular thing. You don't have that much reason why you like it. It might be a car or a motorbike or whatever. Um, you like the aesthetics of it, and hence you might like the entire range of that particular manufacturer. Um, that's not irrational. It's it's just without great reason at the moment because next year a new range might come out, and you like that range. Or 10 years later, you look at the range that you liked and thought, oh, that's that's quite outdated. Why did I even like that at the time? But but I mean, in general, um, logic overrides. One of the examples I was thinking about was um, as much as I would love super bikes and, and do always love super bikes, what bike did I end up riding? I end up, ended up riding a very practical bike. Um, as much as I might like a Porsche, uh, I'd end up riding sort of a, a mom's taxi type of car, something with space, um, practical, easy to use. So, so logic overrides feelings. Yeah, I in, in terms of the way you've described um, how TI works for you, I, I to be honest, I really don't have much to add to that. I thought that was explained really well, um, and it it operates in a very similar way for me. Um, the way I describe uh, this uh, this kind of a framework phenomenon, it's the way the way I kind of describe it is is like a filter where information comes in, uh, and the filter itself is the framework, and uh, information that comes in that is going to fit through the filter just falls through. But anytime some piece of information doesn't add up or it seems contradictory, um it automatically uh, it, it kind of gets stuck or it, it flashes like a red light in my head um, as some kind of an error and I need to make sense of that and either I can fit it in to what it is that I already know uh, in terms of the information that I've built up or it just gets thrown out um, or put aside uh, potentially it, it, it can kind of it can act as some kind of an update later when there's context applied to that piece of information uh, but yeah, I, I would kind of describe it as a filter uh, where anything that doesn't add up or seems contradictory uh, doesn't doesn't go through the gaps. It, it gets stuck, and I have to kind of make sense of it. I like the um, when I when I first started listening to the discussions by TI Doms, and um, th there was reference made to this framework. I, I immediately like the analogy in my mind of um, when there's an air crash, and they build those wireframe reconstructions in the hangar and put start sticking up all the parts that they've fished out of the sea and everything and they start building up the aircraft as best they can putting all the pieces in place and i think that is very much like what all the bits of information are for ti um and like what james just said you might find a piece that doesn't seem to fit it's, it's not even part of that airplane that's fine it gets set aside it it may be applicable to some framework that you haven't yet discovered um, and all the pieces that you paste on that framework you don't really know what the meaning of them is yet um, that in the case of the air crash they're looking for the start of a fault or where did a fire start that type of thing and and for for ti doms we've got uh, i heard somebody else say this there's just so many frameworks and the frameworks are inter inter interrelated by other frameworks and every little bit of pe uh, information gets slapped onto a framework somewhere and readjusted later if you, if you find that you were wrong about something. Yeah, I would say that I think TE frameworks are simplified compared to yours. I don't want mine to be too um, technical because the more technical it is, the harder it is to put into action. From you yeah. can you can comment um, from the TE point of view, but from what I've observed of TE, they like to reference immediate obvious facts. Y you could Google it right now, and there's your answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whereas whereas TI DOM, 
might Google and take that as something to be processed later? True or false? Um, what does one do with it? How many yeah. frameworks does this fit into? Um, TE, yes. TE is a person to go to to get a quick answer, and they do it really well. So, so I often think to myself, I don't need to investigate many things because I can ask a TE DOM and they'll grab the answer for me uh, quicker than I can. A TE DOM probably knows what the weather was going to be like today because they've just Googled it or first thing in the morning. They they know the names of actors and actresses. They've they've referenced so many things and they keep all these bits of information. I, I don't do that. I, I grab them from TEs when I need them. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really great word that people use for extroverted judging. They use the word self-evident. So TE is quick with knowing self-evident, obvious information really quickly and really well. I thought that related back to your point. Uh, yeah, Dion. One thing I was thinking about us uh, on, on this topic is um, I'd often hear statements made which lead to either an argument or a discussion. And um, after thinking about it, you sort of realize that the question itself was, was badly clarified. Uh, and an example here is this. A ship was attacked during World War II and it was shot um, hundreds of times and had holes in every area and was taking on water and was sinking. Um, and then this, the people on board that particular, the crew on board that ship didn't want that ship to get into enemy hands, so they scuttled it. Now the question is, who sunk that ship? And and you can, you can, you can take that down to a simple example. Put a little paper, paper boat in a bath and poke 20 holes with a pin in, into it. Um, and it's slowly taken on water and will sink in three minutes. And then you can just clip a big hole into it and it sank in one minute. Who actually sank it? And, and I mean, you can get into debate on that, but really the question now becomes irrelevant because it was both actions caused the sinking. Um, who do you attribute it to? Well, that's you shouldn't be wanting to attribute it to anything. Another example in that line would be along back to the discussion on colors. But this is more um, not not opinion of color. This is the reality of a color. If I showed you 20 different greens, most people would agree that they're viewing a green. This leaf green, this grass green, dark green, light green, medium green, metallic green, all the greens, fairly, fairly consistent that people would say, yes, you're looking at a green. A little bit different when you're talking about red. Red tends to be red when it's red. And as soon as you've added a little bit of white to it, you're now talking about pinks. But that's only because the English language has this word that covers the entire category from something that is just slightly off red in the pink spectrum up to very, very light pinks. But are they all reds? Now, with a lot of people, when you ask them and show them a pink, is this red? You'd get the answer no. But, but it's no different from the greens. All the light greens were green. All the pinks are not classified as red, but they are technically. So that's a clarification of what what really do you want to know about it the rgb content of each color which which one was the dominant percentage and so on i digress Fantastic. no it's true the, the question we ask sometimes is not what the other person heard you know i tend to ask for an efficiency you know a, for a te answer most of the time uh, that's what I'm looking for. And so when somebody hesitates or is gathering their thoughts to give a longer answer, that to me comes off as I have to be careful to not assume that they're not going to tell me the truth. Because to me, I wouldn't hesitate to answer a question. So, so when somebody else does hesitate and they start to gather their thoughts, it's something that I almost had to learn to go, wait, just because they're stopping to gather their thoughts doesn't mean they're going to tell me you know, something wrong that just, you know, but sometimes I have to look at that and go, okay, that's okay that they're stopping together their thoughts. But I've also learned at, at sometimes you have to, like you said, make sure that they're hearing which, what your question was really asking and that they're not answering it. Uh, they're not interpreting the question 
different, you know, they thought your question was looking for a different answer than you were looking for at the moment. Yeah, I luckily, I, I don't think I would do that to people, probably because by, by nature, I'm just so used to everything being a slowdown while we think about it. So yeah. I wouldn't mind I wouldn't if I at this, not at this, not at this stage of life, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. That would be something that I think would be more typical of a younger TE user, you know, because I think, you know, as you age, you, you, you're going to run into enough people who stop together their thoughts that you'll realize, oh, this is a, <laughs> this is a normal function for half the people of the world to stop, <laughs> yeah. stop, gather thoughts, then speak, you know, you're, you, you do figure that out. It's, but I would say that'd be more of a factor for someone who's probably under 25 you know, 25 would probably be the latest age at which you'd probably still see that happening. Younger than, you know, teens, I think, would be the ones most obvious that would have probably that gut reaction to it because they haven't necessarily learned otherwise. Yeah, I have I think that the phenomenon that Amy's talking about, that, that TE efficiency where you want a quick, snappy answer, that's definitely something I've, I've experienced on the opposite end um, where someone has asked me a question and they may not get an answer immediately but the reason for that is that i need time to consider uh i need to i need time to consider a precise answer so i want i want to give a, the correct answer but i also want to phrase the answer as carefully um, and precisely as possible and um, mm -hmm. in in the least redundant way possible mm -hmm. so i'm thinking about the way i'm going to phrase the answer i'm thinking about the answer itself and that obviously takes a bit more time than someone who just wants uh, a quick answer is, is is going to be willing to spend. But so what I've noticed is that when pe people who, and I, again, I'm guessing here, I'm assuming they're TE, when, when they don't get the answer in the time they want, they answer the question for themselves or they, they answer on behalf of the person or they direct the person to the answer. Um, that's something I've noticed. Whereas for me, if I ever ask a question, I it's just an intuitive instinctual response. I, I tend to let the person answer uh, in whatever way they give the answer. And then once the answer has emerged, we can talk about the, how precise it is and uh, whether or not it was correct and potentially what methods or mechanisms can we use to, to achieve the right answer. Really insightful, James. I noticed that too with some TEs that I know. If I take too long, they might start trying to fill in the holes for me. <laughs> it's, it's like a helping fun function. So sometimes they'll try to help you by filling it in. And, and the frustrating thing for me is that the answer that I know that they want, because I, kn I know what answer they're looking for, but because I'm more interested in giving the most precise answer, they're never going to get the answer they want. So I find it, the reason I find it frustrating is that the answer they think is the most appropriate, I think is the least precise. <laughs> mm, yep. uh, and, yep. and I find that really, re really frustrating because typically they think the answer they wanted you to give is the best answer. Whereas usually I couldn't think they're more wrong. So I see this a lot in work where, so there's a, there's a huge culture in medicine of I mean, you've probably seen television programs like Grey's Anatomy or Scrubs or, you know, any, any, any of these shows where the junior doctors get grilled on ward rounds by the senior doctors and, you know, they get asked all of these really quick, quick questions and they want really snappy answers to them. Uh, and that's actually quite reflective of, you know, what goes on in, in hospitals. It's, it's very much you know, every, every sort of day is an opportunity to teach or lecture. But it's very easy to spot the surgeons and the uh, the cardiologists who are very much TE doms who expect a very quick one word snappy answer when for someone like me, I want to give an extraordinarily precise contextualized answer, uh, you know, in, in just the right amount of words, but that's yeah. not what they're after. And as a result, there's a huge barrier in communication there because either they, sometimes they perceive incompetence where actually it's it's not incompetence. It's just yeah, a completely yeah. different way of internalizing information and, and expressing it. Yeah, I've now, experienced I gotta... quite a bit of that, yeah. 
I got a question. When you're giving these contextualized answers, do you find yourself um, quoting facts verbatim? Or do you find yourself um, not? Because I run into my brothers with their TI. They, one of them in particular, he's very young. He's in high school. He, he wants to give these contextualized answers, but he's not quoting his facts correctly. You know, he's kind of either he's misquoting what somebody actually said, or he's saying, you, you know, this other principle over here, and he's not totally explaining it. And he's trying to get you to like, in a sense, maybe fill in those gap, those pieces for him because he doesn't know how to quite say it. But it comes across to my ears like, like, no, he's actually misquoting and he doesn't have his facts straight, which then flags for me as a big old red herring of an issue. So I'm wondering if that's something that you've ever noticed people doing is they or, or yourself doing on that side. Or I'm wondering if that's maybe more of an intuitive sensor split of uh, intuitives because they use so many metaphors, they're um, they're kind of giving me a little bit more of a metaphorical answer when I'm looking for a more of a um, more of a concrete sensor answer going on. Yeah, I, I um, I'm thinking about that now that you've said that, and I think that that is often the case with uh, certainly the case with intuitives in my life versus sensors. Um, you'll 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 get the the I, I find this a, a lot of times the sensor is looking for more uh kind of the granular um information when i'm i find like the higher level sometimes more uh i don't know a little more nuanced in some way so it's more interesting it's more encompassing uh -huh. that's a good word for it yeah I can, I can definitely under, I, I, yeah, Kat, I think I can identify with what you're talking about there. I, so I tend to enjoy conversations on more of an abstract level where you have, you kind of don't need the detail because the detail is subsumed in concepts. Um, so we don't need to talk about spe a specific animal in, so I'll try and make this very tangible. So let's say you're talking about, um, you know, animal cruelty or uh you know the fact that there isn't really any objective reason why it, it's it would be you know morally wrong to kill a cow on a farm versus you know a cat or a dog but so so i find that i tend to speak in terms of the animals involved rather than the specific animal that we're talking about so someone might say my dog or my cat and they make it as tangible as possible or they personalize it um, Whereas what I'm, I'm really talking about is, is just purely the concept uh, and we don't need specifics or, or extra information. And I, I find sensors a lot of the time, they want, they want illustrative examples, whereas I'm, I'm more concerned with concepts because for me, the aim is to prove a point and illustra illustrations don't actually prove points, they just provide examples. So I'm less, when I can understand the concept, I don't find the need for tangible illustrative information, um, because I'm, I'm you're kind of talking on on a, on a different. It, it, it's almost like a completely different wavelength. I can't I can't explain it. Yeah. Do you feel like you sometimes maybe don't like quote previous conversations verbatim? Like I have a tendency, if like we've talked before on this subject, and I'm bringing it up again, I'm going to quote pretty much verbatim what was said before as my yeah. illustrative point and i found some other people they they don't quote it verbatim as they're proving a point and that just really <laughs> really ticks me off on the side of it feels like they're they're um not not telling the truth about what actually had happened you know because we yeah. were talking specific instances and that very much frustrates me because sometimes i'm like you're, you're trying to prove something but that's not what it you know that wasn't what was said and you're not even you're not trying to expand upon what i said to you know to give a clear picture of what i said you're just you paraphrased what i said 
without expanding upon it. And now I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> why'd you turn, the, change the terms of, of the facts without actually expanding enough upon it that I actually understand why you changed the facts? Yeah, so I can't speak for the, I can't speak for Joyce or Kat um, or any other intuitives out there, but certainly for me, uh, giving any more information than I feel I need to would, would appear redundant. So if I'm speaking in terms of concepts or a, a general idea, or I'm giving some kind of an analogy, uh, it would almost feel redundant to have to illustrate with very tangible examples. I kind of expect people to be able to grasp the concept and to fill in the details themselves because the details would be assumed in whatever concept I'm talking about. So I actually find that I lose interest when somebody expects me to give more information than I feel I need to. It almost feels like I'm I'm dumbing it down or something like that. I can't, that's how I would explain it, yeah. Okay, what about you, Dion? Do you find you quote, um, quote information it, or well, other ISTPs quote information verbatim or okay. is it a... Well, I'm I'm certainly not skilled at remembering um, exact conversations. So no, I'd say I'm more likely to quote the fundamental of what was being discussed. Um, you agreed well to do such and such. You you liked such and such when we last spoke, um, etc. Um, but referring to what James just said as well, I like conversation with INTPs um, and I like conversation with with TI DOMS in general but I think unlike the INTP I'm quite aware that a discussion is going to get quite theoretical and probably go in a circle it's it's going to be very philosophical and and that's um, I mean I have done the philosophical route at a stage probably in my 20s but it's not it's not what grabs me now so I'm I'm more keen on fund on on sorry sorry on concrete um, yeah if you want to call it on on sensor on real world situation, um, and and I'd prefer to debate on those terms um, if it's going to get philosophical I don't mind listening I don't mind popping in the odd the odd uh, statement here and there but it's 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 probably not my my strength uh, I get the feeling that's definitely a more an INTP thing. But um, in the same sense, I do agree with what James said that when 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 too much information is required, when too much explanation is required, um, that may get pretty boring for the INTP. I don't really experience that. I, I I seem to think most people want the fastest answer they could get out of you, and don't. I, I need to cut back on how much explanation I was giving to people to the point where I actually don't give any explanation unless they looked like they wanted more to, uh, to to get back to what amy was really getting at there's would i use quotations implying falsity no never um well, yeah he's not trying to imply falsity he's just not quoting accurately and so it comes across yeah. as a falsity oh, okay right it, it, in my to me because i'm like i i remember that conversation i remember the word said that's not what was said and so it doesn't sound similar to me you know mm, yeah yeah interesting intuitives tend to place priority on the overview of the concept rather than the details and it can almost feel like slowing down to say all of the details can feel like they're disrespecting the most important part which is the significant concept it's taking away attention from what to the intuitive seems like the most important part which is the concept yeah from my point of view my primary motive on everything is understanding um, so understanding the reason for a truth um, so that i can even determine whether a statement should be regarded as valid or not i don't mind abstract and conceptual conversations but i need a concrete jumping point to get in a lot of times like i need at least one concrete illustration to riff on to get to where you're going where i think sometimes it's the um that's not how intuitives work when they're trying to I'll, learn something i'll give you an example of this this framework um that i sort of realized specifically in my life as a ti dom when i was a kid and i observed certain animals 
not for the first time, but when you started sort of realizing what you were looking at, um, now me being SE second, I, I, I tend to notice in great detail almost everything. So anyway, um, you look at you look at birds, you look at cats, you see your dogs, all of these animals are around you when you're growing up as a kid and you, you start realizing that the feet of a dog look somewhat similar to our hands. The feet of a cat look the same as the feet of a dog, but the feet of most animals in, in that category and then sort of, yes, that's because they're mammals, you're told. And, I, and I'm sort of thinking to myself, yeah, but the, the fact that they really actually do have that sort of layout, um, almost the same number of digits. Um, it, it's sort of like I'm, I'm asking the question, why exactly do animals have two eyes, a nose, a mouth, all of these shapes? They look very, very similar. I mean, chimpanzees, sure, look really similar to us, but a dog also looks really similar to us. And and there wasn't really an answer given. So you, you place this piece of information on your framework um, and as you grow up, you sort of realize more and more, yeah, okay, there's categories of animals that have certain features and so on. But only later, um, when, when I studied a bit uh, of paleontology on the side, I mean, just from an observer's point of view, do you, do you realize that, in fact, th there's a very simple reason is because they all, they all go back to common ancestors. We, we do dogs and humans evolved from common ancestors and so did many other types so why the the whys of certain questions as we're growing up are, are pretty important and they get the, the answers that we get given may not make sense to us in fact the person may have been lying outright or didn't know themselves so they just gave some stupid answer but this gets placed on our on our framework and and gradually you you adjust these bits of framework and i mean religion is certainly one of them every aspect of it, any answer that anyone ever gave you on religion gets placed on this framework and gradually as you're growing up you you find that the pieces aren't fitting they they're not you're, you're not finding you're not finding substantiating evidence for any of the pieces of information that you're trying to fit onto a particular framework and so you take those pieces off and put them in a pile next to the bin. <laughs> I was going to say, Dion, <clears throat> religion is a is a, probably a TI's worst nightmare. <laughs> well, I I found it I, f I found it quite interesting because I gave it a good I gave it a good try. I I I, I listened. I I evaluated what people were reading. You know. I looked at what people were doing in the church um, and I put all these pieces on my framework. Now, a very early one was, uh, and this was as a kid, was that when when I die, um, nothing different is going to happen to me than the dogs that I saw that were knocked over by the side of the road and were lying there rotting or the cat. Um, no, you're going to go to heaven. No, I don't think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm going to look like that dog. You know, I'm going to be a rotting carcass. No, but heaven, heaven, and the more they speak about this, and okay, well, where is this place? Well, it's up in the clouds. Well, where up in the clouds? Well, you can't really say exactly where up in the clouds. And the more vague the answers that that were sort of supplied, and all of all of these pieces that just didn't seem to fit. Gradually, you realize, okay, okay, I understand what's what's happening with the whole religion thing. It's it's a construct to suit a certain group of people's beliefs. I would say that religion, any type of religion, or even very fundamental personal philosophy, is going to be based on a a, a faith held position, and I I think it's natural, particularly for T.I. Domus, to come to the conclusion of I don't know what the essential as you said James outsider frame supplying framework person is I think that's a very natural conclusion for a TI Dom to come to that conclusion um, and I would say that any any other type if they were being honest about it when they come to those things if they say they have an outside supplied framework is going to have to say that it was it's something that becomes more of an issue of 
belief as opposed to being um, physically deductible or um, or logically deduced, you know, I, I would say that all those things have to come from a non logic supplied area. And what you choose for all those things is just, it's going to depend on person to person based on the knowledge you've gained in your personal belief system when it comes to that. Interesting thoughts, everyone. Amy, you mentioned a point about how you need to have a concrete reference point in order to want to learn the abstract concept associated with that. I feel like intuitives are the, the opposite of that. They kind of want the concept or none of the examples will ever stick. Like they don't, they're like, why is this example here? <laughs> yeah, so intuitives will ignore all the examples until there's a concept that makes sense with it. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you, Thinker Doms, for your wonderful thoughts about the truth. <laughs> I love how the TIs will be so precise when trying to figure out how things logically fit within their framework. I love how y'all put so much thoroughness into developing your framework and the amount of work you put into vetting all the possible exceptions or how everything fits into this specific way, like this framework. Yeah, so I appreciate your ability to spot contradictions. Yeah, it, and your ability to clean slice logic and the criticalness which you view everything through the OS in which you view logic. I really enjoyed learning about your TI filter, yeah. Yeah, the JI functions are kind of like filters that we have. Yeah, so that was an amazing way of putting it. And thank you, TEs, for being able to be pragmatic with logic. <laughs> I love how you turn things actionable, how you're able to figure out how to use logic as like a launching pad for action. That's very helpful and it's very amazing and it's very skillful use of, of logic. <laughs> I, I love how confident UTEs are able to say statements and the speed at which you're able to answer too. I love that certainty and that can do that kind of go-getter attitude with that thinking function. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, with TE users, it really helps um, it, it accelerate the rate at which things get done. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for making this well-functioning world. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, yes, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I don't know. Thanks for us. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This is a magnificent chat about the truth. And I love learning about the ways in which we can see truth. And thank you for just this thought provoking conversation, everyone. This was rich with insight and rich with, um, which rich with the truth. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yeah. And for everyone who liked this part one, I look forward to a part two of this series as well. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining in and see everyone in the next episode. Bye everyone. <laughs>